if I think back to 2001, all of 20 years ago, um, at that point in time, the majority of Australian housing had no insulation. Uh, we weren't talking about air tightness. Um, the, generally speaking, the temperature inside the house was very close to the temperature outside the house, unless we had mechanical, as in a, a heat pump or an air conditioner um, or a firebox. So I guess that, that was the pretty much the standard of the housing all around Australia. I guess what changed or caused the changes was in 1998, the Australian government agreed that we need to do something about climate change. Um, and it's interesting, the first treaties about climate change in 1967. So that, that step took 30 years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and part of the greenhouse gas process was identifying what they called low hanging fruit. And it was seen that adding insulation to, to houses and, and to residential and non-residential buildings would reduce the energy used to heat and cool buildings. So in essence, the whole evolution of insulating our houses wasn't about human health, wasn't about better buildings, it was about trying to reduce the amount of energy Australians used, which is principally from coal-powered, coal-fired power stations, to, gen um, to generate electricity, which we were using to heat and cool our, by international standards, low-grade housing. <laughs> Mm. And, and I guess why I see international standards is that places like Canada or America or North America or, or Europe, they get minus 20 or minus 30 in winter and people die. <laughs> we don't have that sort of cold climate in Australia. So we could have, we were allowed to be quite lazy on this aspect until we thought about this issue about climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, that's, there's so much in that. So when, I guess when we, insulate our buildings, we're solving one problem um, from an energy, energy point of view. What other sort of things that are unintended consequences that can come out of this that, you know, from a multidisciplinary point of view that we need to be looking at as well when we're doing this? And that's really good, especially in the COVID realm, which is quite interesting. Yeah. But, uh, I guess as we make buildings, as we insulate our buildings, we create very different, what we call environmental conditions on the inside and outside of built fabric. So that's the, the temperature of, let's say, a piece of plasterboard versus the temperature of, of a weatherboard. It's the amount of moisture in the plasterboard relative to the amount of moisture in the weatherboard. So we have temperature and humidity or temperature and moisture through all our components. We also have the air quality inside the building. Um, we, I can say with some confidence until about 2010, our leaky buildings is what made them healthy, not anything else. The fact that our, our windows leaked, our doors, that we had big gaps around doors and floors and windows, um, that provided healthy buildings. What I, what I mean by that, I guess, in a, in a different way, is that the code um, and, and since, you know, the building regulations since the 1800s around Australia and elsewhere have had this general rule of 10% um, of your floor area is a window, and that provided daylight into the space. So we didn't need to use electric lighting. Half of that, 5%, so based on the old double hung window, could we put the double hung window up, was our ventilation rule. So the presumption within the code, which is not a presumption, it's a rule within the code, <laughs> is that every house has 5% of its floor area as operable windows, based on the old double hung window. And it was, and, and, and from that inferral, everyone opened our windows every day in every room to provide ventilation. Well, I guess the reality is that didn't happen in, in most, whether it was for sound, acoustic, outdoor noise, whether it's security, whether it's the frightened media saying it's an evil world out there, whether in the case of Melbourne, 80, I think it's 86% of the time, it's less than 18 degrees outside. So why would you have your window open if it's colder outside than inside? And if I go to Darwin, where it's 33 degrees outside and we want it to be 27, ward out my window to let in that hot air. So the, the principle behind the ventilation was, I would say, is antiquated. And we relied on our leaky buildings to allow our foul air to leak out of the building and fresh air to leak in. The, as, as we've made our buildings better insulated, we've created this this temperature and humidity difference. And as we've made our enclosures better, we've kept the bad air in rather than allowing it to leak out. And 
Is there, so without that ventilation now, we're letting the air in. I mean, what's the follow-on consequences of that? And is there any international sort of, you know, case studies or anyone overseas that have had this sort of issue? And then, um, you know, and then maybe they're, maybe where Australia is 10 years or so behind them potentially. Don't you hate that when you say 10 years behind? I'd say 20 or 30 years. But, anyway. <laughs> but yeah, and, and yeah. I guess once again, because they've got much more extreme climates, they've had to look at some of these things much earlier than us. Oh, I'll be nice to Australia sometimes. <laughs> yeah. um, but, and I enjoy Australia's climate. So um, the, I guess I'll, I'll tackle that in two different ways, two different aspects. One is what we call the condensation and mold problem. So because we've created very different temperatures between the inside skin and outside skin of our building, what's now happening is that the somewhere we have, we have this thing we call dew point temperature. And so depending on the air pressure and the amount of moisture in the air and the temperature, the water in the air becomes water. So it goes from being water vapor to being water. And, and I guess we often hear the term relative humidity and so that relative humidity is the amount of moisture in the air. As air cools, like a sponge, it needs to get rid of the water. So if I've got a sponge full of water and I'm compressing it, it'll get to a point where the water needs to come out of the sponge. And so air works in that same principle. So depending on the interior temperature and the interior relative humidity and the outside temperature humidity, somewhere between those two surfaces, that moisture is going to form. And that's um, a very new thing for Australia because of, we now have better housing from an envelope perspective, but we're creating this challenge in the wall systems. So around the wall, world, we have what we call high growth thermal simulation. So high growth water and thermal and, and tools we use to calculate or simulate what's happening to that wall system. We physically can't stop condensation from occurring unless we leave earth, unless we stop breathing. <laughs> um, I, I see lots of ads on TV saying, we stop condensation, well, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that's about how that. we, we know we can't stop that from occurring. So it's about understanding that, how do we make our wall systems that accept that occurs, but the wall system can get wet, can get dry. That might be daily, it might be nightly, it might be seasonally, but over the long term, the amount of moisture doesn't affect the wall structural approach and doesn't support mold growth. And so that's that's a big change in terms of, as we've moved from four star to five star to six star, we've seen a, 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 a steep increase in terms of concern regarding condensation of mold in buildings. And this is why. Um, the, from, from the health aspect or the, or the um, or mold simply affects health, we have twice the asthma rate of the OECD. Um, and until 2019, we were the only developed country did not, that did not have building regulations that mentioned condensation or mold. So there's, you know, we could say, we could argue that there's a distinct correlation there. And, and there's a whole range of other things that people get sick from, from mold, and, and often get phone calls from people describing a medical condition. And I'm saying, um, you probably need to move out of your house really, really quickly. So um, if you can, because it's hard because people might have mortgages or they might be stuck in a rental situation and it gets becomes very difficult. The air quality thing. So we have a thing called, we call an air change rate, ACR. And in an air change rate, we know that below five, the rate of air change becomes unsafe for us. And, and this is, we've had that in a strange standard for about 20 years. So it's not a new thing. Uh, that, that's been used quite extensively in commercial buildings, which is why our office buildings have ducted air conditioning systems. But in our smaller buildings, we've relied on this will open our windows. Mm. As because we're opening our windows, we need to move a bit further forward in our thinking about how ventilation works. Other countries have what they call entropy um, recovery ventilation systems. So in the cold places, they call them heat recovery. In the cool, and in the hot places, they call them cool recovery. And what they do, they're continually measuring the temperature and humidity inside the building. And if the humidity gets too high, they use 20 watts, 5 watts, 10 watts, depending on the size of the system, to bring in fresh air that doesn't have the same amount of humidity 
and take out the high humidity air. Or if it's a CO2 sensor, it brings in air with less CO2 and takes out the high CO2 air. And, and so it, it sensors manage that and they just come quietly in the background when needed. And so it takes away, I guess, this challenge of with dual income families, with families working at home or working away or, um, you know, with it's security, whatever it might be, um, it takes away the human factor in terms of, oh, I haven't opened the windows today and we're all falling asleep watching telly. Okay. <laughs> so how we manage those sorts of things. So, so you were saying how like for big commercial buildings, you might have some sort of mechanical ventilation. So is that for your residential, anyone listening right now, just your house, you, you might install this sort of um, design principle. Is that uh, right? Or Okay, that's a good question. Maybe so, just open your windows if you are. <laughs> please you please are open your windows. <laughs> if, if, I guess this is a challenge. Um, as I was saying before, you know, Melbourne, like even, even in Sydney, I think it's um, well, Brisbane. So Brisbane, we think we know uh, for 50% of the hours in a year, it's less than 18 degrees Celsius. Now we feel thermal, if I'm sitting in my desk or watching till it might be, if it's less than 20 degrees Celsius, I start to feel cold. So, so we might put a jump run or but there's this, what we call this managing this thermal comfort thing. So even in mm. Brisbane, which we think of going there for our warm holidays, for 50% of the hours in the year, it's less than 18 degrees Celsius. So, so then just look at, well, how often would you have your window open based on that situation? And as we come further and further south in Australia, those hours increase. I think Hobart's 92% of the hours in a year. So realistically, we wouldn't be wanting someone in Hobart who's using a heater to have their window open for all those hours. Yeah. Otherwise, they're just heating Hobart. So it's, it's fine, this fine balance. Um, in a, in a, and I guess in big commercial buildings, we have a ducted ventilator, we call HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. And we have those big systems because it's a big building with lots of people and it needs to be managed by a machine. When we come to houses, um, a lot of houses in North America and Europe used to have ducted air conditioning, but they established in the 1990s that's a like now that many of those systems are extremely inefficient. So they were efficient at making the hot or cold air, but the delivery of that hot or cold air through ducts and squiggly things and all that sort of things suddenly meant that it wasn't efficient. And so there was a big shift from the first decade of this century, the 2000s, to replace ducted air conditioning in North America and Europe with what we call split systems. So that's where we have the compressor unit on the outside, but just a fan unit on the inside. And so that unit on the inside isn't changing the air, it's just keeping the same air in, but it's heating or cooling the air. So those countries did those changes because for their needs to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. But they found in the, you know, by 2010 that, oh, that solved the greenhouse gas problem, but now we've got this bad air inside our buildings. <laughs> So, so, so that so out of that evolved this whole heat recovery ventilation system, which is a separate thing to the heater or cooler, but it's just managing for a very low wattage the quality of air, so in terms of CO two, and in terms of water vapor within the within the building. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess before I leave that one, that's a good. I thought you last next question, <laughs> and I guess in the context that I can I could go to an apartment in Munich and they'd have a small unit on the wall near the kitchen. And they wouldn't have a kitchen range hood because they don't need one. Because I guess you got to think, if you have a kitchen range hood and you turn this big fan on, where's the supply air coming from? Unless you open the kitchen door or the window, you've got no supply, it doesn't, doesn't work. So this understanding of in these small apartments, you might have a unit or a small house, you have a system that can manage most of the needs of the house. As you move to bigger buildings, it does become more complex uh, or bigger apartments or bigger houses. And you might need to have a, a couple of the units or you might, you might see on these, um, some of these TV shows late at night where they've got these things like a big octopus in the roof of a house. Um, and I guess the challenges with those, for me, with those big octopuses is that they require regular maintenance and tuning um, so that they work efficiently and you don't have things growing inside the pipes. <laughs> so um, I guess that's one of the challenges we have. Australia has the biggest housing on the planet. Um, per, our per square metres per person is world leading. 
Um, so we're actually creating other problems in how we manage these things in our bigger houses. It seems like the, yeah, there's a lot of issues that it goes into this and mm. ventilation is one of them. And another one you touched on was obviously uh, mold growth, which um, obviously can occur when moisture in timber reaches a certain level. So what, what are the, say we're using timber as part of our envelope, um, what are some of the good principles of design to ensure that, you know, we're not really trapping moisture in the wrong way within the building and, and uh, having this mold growth, which is going to have the issues for human health? A really good question. So there, we have, so all, all materials, sorry, majority of materials absorb and allow the flow of water vapour. And I guess it's, it's interesting when we think about, I can put a piece of plasterboard up on my wall but and it will stop the flow of air because air is really big molecules. But that same piece of plasterboard will allow water vapour to go right through because water vapour is so small. Um, and, and then... It's funny because when we look, well, I shouldn't say funny, <laughs> but uh, when we think about mold spores, mold spores are smaller than a smaller than coronavirus. <laughs> so, so yeah. you know, if I if I go into a house where there's mold spores, it, they they go straight through my flanges, you know, lung into my lungs and straight into my bloodstream. So it's a direct path, which is why people have mold, what we call mold sickness. It's an immunology and allergy condition because it's gone straight into the bloodstream and the body sees this thing in its blood and it has a reaction to it. So that, so there's a, there's a smallness of mold spores. Um, and water vapour is smaller than that. <laughs> so so it, it's, it's this understanding the smallness of, of an object. So with that in mind, our paint allows water vapour through, our plasterboard allows water vapour through, our timber frame in our walls and, and our insulation allow water vapour through. Um, and we then have a membrane on the outside of that. And how does that membrane support or not support water vapour transport? And then what's behind that? And so I, I put that in the context of a brick veneer wall, which is our most common construction system in Australia. We have the brick on the outside, which we know gets wet on both the outside surface and the inside surface. It, it, there's more, and, and so the brick, since that system evolved in the 1930s, the brick is not allowed to touch the frame because the brick is wet. We need to not, and so that way we have this, what we call this ventilated cavity between the brick and the frame that takes that moisture away. Sadly, our weatherboard, plywood, cement sheet, polystyrene, table panel wall systems um, in Australia were what we call direct fixed. So they were hard fixed against the frame but all these materials still get moisture on the inside. <laughs> so what was, what was happening is that our vapors leaving the building, but then hitting this cold thing that's hard against the wall. Now, when we didn't have a membrane there, that might've been okay in some climates because it hits the back of the weatherboard, weatherboard gets wet, you know, but when we put a membrane there, it's the membrane that's getting wet. And, and the membrane is getting wet on the outside and inside surfaces. On the inside surface, that's then within our timber frame and insulation system. So moisture on the insulation means insulation works less, works, insulation works less, which means it gets colder and colder, the problem gets worse. Mm. And our timber absorbs the moisture up to a certain point. But as soon as if it keeps absorbing, absorbing moisture, the timber becomes sodden as well. So there's this need to think about all our construction systems the same as a brick veneer, where there's an, a ventilated air cavity between the cladding system and the framing system. That's one issue. The next issue I, I sort of hinted at was we've got this membrane thing. And so if, I've got, if I'm not understanding that water vapor is traveling through my wall, I need to use a membrane that doesn't stop that water vapor flow. If it's a membrane that stops the water vapor flow, the humidity inside my insulated timber frame gets higher and higher and higher until it just turns the water inside the frame. So you need to think about how that system works to provide that. So we say step one's a cavity and step two is to have a vapor permeable membrane. And most manufacturers of, of reputable, reputable manufacturers have vapor permeable membranes. 
And the Australian standard has a value for what we call vapor resistance or, vapor, or the inverse of vapor diffusion, which they have um, numbers, you know, new numbers um, for what is a vapor pimple membrane. And so the, the better manufacturers have on their labeling that it's a vapor pimple membrane, and it's a class three or class four with this number beside it. So, but at the same time, there's many other products out there <laughs> which aren't vapor pimple. Um, I can say that in a, a, a national chain I had a discussion with a couple of years ago. Um, they said it's not their job to tell customers what to buy, it's their job to put stuff on the shelf. <laughs> and until customers stop buying it, they'll keep putting it on the shelf. Okay. So it's that awareness of it's not necessarily the cheapest product, it's the right product for the right location. Um, so I guess what I've talked about there is this need to have a cladding system, which can be wet on both sides, a ventilated space, and then an insulation layer. If we then turned it up, up a different way and thought about our roof system, the roof is the same. We have our insulation above our ceiling because we're conditioning our room. There's no point putting insulation up on our roof because unless we're hitting or cooling our roof space, we're just wasting our money. Hmm. So then the roof space is then needs to be ventilated. And the roofing material can get wet on both sides. And even in Darwin, um, the roofing material gets wet on the underside at night due to what we call night sky losses or night sky cooling, where we're losing all our energy to outer space. So in all our clumps in Australia, roofing material gets wet on the top side and the bottom side, the same as a brick on a wall. So we need to think about our roof systems the same way. We then turn it up the other way to our floor systems. I've got a nice timber floor. I put my insulation under my timber floor and the code since its inception and, and even um, state ordinances before we had the National Construction Code required subfloor ventilation. So, so this principle of the brick veneer wall works on all sides. Earlier you hinted at the, the NCC 2019 is, is trying to tackle this issue. So what does it actually uh, mandate currently? Because I've seen a few projects and it doesn't really get, I don't know if it's well known still that this change is there. And do you think it's enough, um, does the job enough for whatever it says? I'm, I'm, I'm a dreamer. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm a hopeful person. I'm a positivist. <laughs> so, so I guess the the code is a democratic document. We have we have um, eight jurisdictions. I think that's right. <laughs> um, and, um, and 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 so and, and those jurisdictions all have to agree for any change to occur in the code. So so and of course the code isn't good practice. The code is minimum practice. And I guess that's an interesting aspect where. In, in several Northern European countries and even in North America, they have their building regulation, but they have, this, they have industry based or government based documents which say this is 30% better than code or 50% or even 80% better than code. So, sadly, in Australia, the majority of housing is built just to code, just. And, and invariably, when we have audits, there's lots of comments about how many of the houses aren't to code. So, so there's a challenge there regarding our focus in Australia. Uh, which is a bit different to other countries where I guess maybe it comes back to the issue that those other countries are much colder and people will say, well, I want my house to work. I don't care what the regulations say, I want my house to work. Whereas in Australia, we sort of fight to the bottom, <laughs> sadly. And so in that context, what went into the code in 2019 was step one. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I say step one because it only applied to class one and class two buildings. So um, standalone houses and um, apartment buildings, nothing else. Um, so all those mold problems in schools and other buildings don't really exist apparently <laughs> at this point in time. And it only applied in climate zones six, seven and eight. So Australia's divided up into eight climate zones from climate zone one in hot and humid Darwin down to climate zone eight, for places like Mount Buller in Victoria, the snowfields. So it only applied to Australia's coolest climates. Now, for me, there was a concern because we had a nationwide survey that was distributed by the Australian Building Codes Board in 2016. And we um, won the job of trying to assess that data, which was always challenging when someone else writes the survey. But what the survey highlighted was that every single jurisdiction 
the respondents, which are the building and construction design professionals and, and, and construction building design and building construction professionals, all responded with there's a problem. So not just cold Australia, all of Australia. So we so that reinforced that we knew there was a significant problem. And so applying it only to Australia's coolest climates isn't addressing the problem for the rest of Australia. The other issues I mentioned about you know, this idea of having a cladding system, a cavity and a permeable membrane and a framed. The code doesn't require a cavity in anything except for a clay masonry construction. So right now I can build a house that doesn't apply most of the rules I've just mentioned. Um, whether it's a cathedral roof, whether it's a direct fix system, um, uh, whether it's a house with inadequate subfloor ventilation, I can build that right now. And I'm going to tick all the boxes in the code. And this is one of the challenges. Um, I, have a, I have a lot of time for builders and, 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 and their organisations. And, and a lot of the builders say, oh, but I did it to the code. And we're saying, yeah. And they say, but, so, so they're in a difficult situation because they've built a house to the code. They've got a mouldy house. They've got a client complaining and wanting money or repairs, but they've done it to code. So it's creating this very difficult situation around Australia. Absolutely. And then you've got builders competing with each other and, you know, mm -hmm. on price. And then perhaps if you're competing on price and obviously the minimum standards and the yep. cheapest is going to win out to the other builder. Yes, yes, yes. So there, there's, it just creates this really ugly, disappointing and stressful, stressful. Most of the builders I've talked to, because that, that's their business. They, they don't, you know, they, they want to be there for another 20 or 30 years, whatever it is might be. Um, and, and they find the whole process quite stressful. And, um, and condensation and mould and, and moisture, these moisture problems are a design flaw, not an event. So there's no insurance. Um, you know, it's not a flood. It's not, it's not an event that's caused the problem. It's a design flaw. And so they're left with this, this uninsured situation. So what that's led to is some, as you said, there's builders who don't care or, or care less, care less. And they're saying, yes, we'll just do what the, this. There's the builders who care more and saying, look, we need to, it needs to be cost more than that because we need to do these things. Mm -hmm. And the market is, as in the customers, are generally uninformed and don't understand the long-term consequences of these decisions. And, and then, so I guess it's how this is, is or isn't coming together. In a, in a sensible way. It, it's hoped or planned or hoped, I should hoped because not, nothing's in ink yet, um, but it's hoped that the code for 2022 will, it will include more of Australia, um, but once again, still only housing and apartment buildings, and it still doesn't require a cavity. <laughs> so, so, um, it, so it's still, once again, it's, you know, That'll come in in 2022 if it, if it, if it gets inked. Um, once again, the democ democratic process has to flow. And so the next change will not be until 2025. So um, I think there's an importance that the design and construction professions and the market, the homeowners and apartment owners, need to understand this more and for the market to drive it and, and for the market to understand the risks associated with not understanding these things in greater detail. As a, as a, as a comparison to that, one of the houses I looked at back in 2016 when we were doing looking at lots of houses back then, and one of the calls we got was from a lady who'd recently moved over from Germany. And so we went and looked at her place and we're going through this house, we're going through the underneath, we're going through the and up in the roof on a single piece timber, there was a little bit of mould. She, and, she, and we thought, oh, she said, but this isn't allowed in Germany. And we were visiting other houses where lounge rooms are full of mould, bathrooms are full of mould, <laughs> and but just showed that very different understanding of this much mould can affect my health. <laughs> and so there's a need for the market to understand this risk and for the market to ask what is or isn't occurring. And uh, all the research and the work you're doing is helping with that. Um, it's been phenomenal speaking to you today, Mark. Uh, and learning about this really important issue. If you want to find out more about yourself and some of the research you're doing, or is there anywhere you want to point people to uh, if they want to learn more? 
Well, thank you, and, and thank you for allowing me to talk today. Um, I guess the if you type in my name <laughs> and um, into um, what's it called Google, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you'll find stuff. But um, also, uh, if you type in my name in UTAS, you'll see uh, my public all the stuff we've been doing there, and also my name and a thing called ResearchGate. Um, it's an international platform where researchers share their stuff, and so um, all my stuff's up on that website as well.